Hello and welcome everybody to our event, uh, Jewish Australian Speculative Fiction Writers in Conversation. We are going to introduce our lovely guests very soon, but we are going to start with introducing ourselves and our project a little bit. My name is Tina Borger and I am one of the Digi Fellows at the Heinrich Heine University of Düsseldorf. As part of our fellowship, we are able to not only teach Australian speculative fiction and develop various digital ways of approaching the topic, including our podcast, Charting the Australian Fantastic, and our mostly student-led blog, both of which we'll advertise on Twitter. But we also have the funding to make events like this one happen. And in fact, there will be more events as our lecture series. So if you follow us on Twitter, look out for those. I'm Lucas Madela, the other Digi Fellow who helped uh, bring about today. And I've been greatly enjoying charting the Australian Fantastic alongside Tina. We are both partners with the Centre for Australian Studies and are editing an issue of Gender Forum that centres around Australian speculative fiction as well. We'd like to please remind everyone to keep their videos off throughout this conversation today, and that will even include us throughout the panel. Uh, unless you're asking questions during the Q&A, uh, in which case we welcome you to kind of unmute your video for that time. This is just in order to help with the technical aspects of WebEx and so on. So the format today is pretty straightforward. Uh, in that we are going to just begin by introducing the panelists. There will be a conversation that will be facilitated through guiding questions that Tina and I ask, and afterwards there will be a Q&A. So, without further ado, let's begin with interest, or introducing our guests. So, we'll start with Jillian. Jillian Pollack is a practicing historian, writer, editor, and teacher. So far, she has published numerous short stories as well as 11 novels with more on the way and edited the short story collection Baggage, which was also a Dietmar finalist. She holds a doctorate in English and another in history, and only partly because of Doctor Who, as well as a Master of Arts in Medieval Studies. She has been an enormous help in organizing today's event, since it started due to one of her tweets, to which I replied, and which led to us having a first Zoom call during which this event began to take shape. Our next panelist is Dr. Jack Dan, uh, who has written or edited over 75 books. He's a recipient of the Nebula Award, the World Fantasy Award twice, the Australian Aurelius Award three times, the Cronus Award, the Daryl Award for Best Mid-South Novel, the Dittmar Award five times, as well as a bunch of other awards. Uh, there's actually too many to list, I would say. He's also been honored by the Mark Twain Society, and uh, there are a lot of uh, wonderful things that have been said about Jack Dan. For example, Library Journal has called him a true poet who can create pictures with a few perfect words. George R. R. Martin has called him an exacting craftsman and a fevered visionary. Jack has told us, though, that he's just a guy who writes stuff and lives in Australia. Of course, there's a whole lot more to him than that, but we would be going on for some time to really cover uh, his contributions to literature. <laughs> And our next panelist, Jason Franks, is the author of Bloody Waters and Fairy Apocalypse and the writer of the Six Myths graphic novels, which I'm sure will come up during this uh, conversation as well. They have variously been shortlisted for Aurealis, Dittmar and Ledger Awards. His short fiction has been published in a variety of magazines and anthologies in the US, Australia and the UK. Born in South Africa, Jason Franks is an Ashkenazi Jew who was raised in a modern Orthodox household. He has lived in Australia since he was 10 years old, excluding a five-year stint in the United States, and enough trips to Japan, where his spouse comes from, that he's lost count. And our final, last but not least, panelist is Rivka Raphael, who writes speculative fiction about queer women, Jewish women, cyborg futures, and hope in dystopias. Her short stories have been published in Strange Fire, Strange Horizons, Escape Pod, and elsewhere. She co-edited feminist robot anthology, Mother of Invention, which won a Dittmar Award and a Norman K. Hemming Award. Her short story, Whom My Soul Loves, won a Dittmar Award for Best Short Story, and many of her other short stories have been shortlisted for Wolf Halara, Digital Literary, Dittmar, and Norma K. Hemming Awards. In 2016, she won the Dittmar Award for Best New Talent. Rivka lives in Sydney, Australia, where she studies psychology, works as a science editor, and dabbles in kitchen alchemy. She can be found online at rivka.net or on Twitter as Enough Snark. It should be said that you can also find our other panelists on Twitter and we have numerously uh, retweeted them there. So if you follow us, you can follow them as well. And in fact, you should. So uh, our first question is to get <laughs> to the heart <laughs> of our discussion. 
So we would like you to discuss what it means for you to be Jewish and Australian as authors of speculative fiction. I can't see myself as anything but Jewish and Australian. My background's a little different to everyone else's because I'm several generations Australian. My family started coming out in 1858. So I don't have as many identities to juggle, which makes it easy to say, hey, it's just one. It's not an easy one, but it is just one. Well, I'm, an, I'm a, a New York expat uh, and I've got dual citizenship and I consider myself a cultural Jew, although, uh, although I'm, an, I'm an atheist. Uh, and I, I, I've written uh, an, enough stories to form a collection and a short novel about uh, the Jewish experience or questioning uh, ideas of the, of the Shoah and of, uh, and of the Jewish experience. And, uh, you know, I consider myself Jewish, Australian, and American. So I don't, I don't know if that says anything, but, uh, but my experience is significantly different from uh, all the rest of, of my friends, i.e. panelists. Uh, I think uh, maybe apart from being a woman, uh, probably being Jewish and Australian, uh, the things that inform my writing the most, um, I do feel like there's a, both of them have a particular tone, a particular kind of humour that often um, works well together, kind of ironic in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I have been in Australia since I was three, so technically I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, but sort of fairly scraped in there. And yeah, I think that that experience of of being being a, an immigrant, and I also grew up in an ultra orthodox community in Melbourne uh, that has kind of uh, it, it comes through in in the writing and in a lot of ways that I'm sure we'll we'll get into in more detail. So for me, it's it's maybe a little a little different. Um, I really probably didn't start thinking of myself as an Australian writer until I was living in the States, um, when it just became too hard to kind of juggle. Yeah, I was born in South Africa and I grew up in Australia and now I live here. Um, so that was kind of, I think when that, that was sort of cemented. Um, and I really didn't identify very much as a Jewish writer until, um, relatively recently. Um, I've rarely, um, written, um, with uh, explicitly Jewish themes. Um, and uh, I, I think um, a lot of my characters are Jewish, but I haven't been overt about it. Um, and that's that's been changing, uh, I guess, through the last five years. Um, I felt a little bit provoked as, I guess, anti-Semitism has kind of, kind of risen and um, that's sort of been my way of addressing it. So um, more and more, mm. uh, I'm including Jewish themes, um, being explicit about characters being Jewish. Um, including some from some work that uh, I've done in the past that um, I think I was maybe camouflaging it or um, at the very least I was, um, I, I, certainly, I certainly wasn't being explicit about it, but um, that's going to probably change in the next year um, with the new work that I have coming out. Well, I didn't realize that that a lot of Jewish writers were hidden and I kind of didn't discover this until the 70s when I edited an anthology called Wandering Stars. And that, that was the first science fiction fantasy anthology uh, that was about uh, using science fiction and fantasy stories. And, uh, and Isaac Asimov did the introduction. Now, again, this is like what, almost you know 40 some years ago. And uh, he said at the time, he said, I, I'm the only writer that I know that's kept his real, the Jewish writer that I know that's kept his real name. It never occurred to me that that would be something that, uh, that, that, that people, that writers felt that they needed to do. And, you know, I still have trouble with it. But again, my experience is probably one of ignorance. Uh, but th there's a lot of writers who, who've used pseudonyms uh, 
in, to, to, to write uh, Jewish writers who use pseudonyms to write uh, to, to write to write their science fiction. I think that changed, but I don't know. I know in Australia, since for as long as I can remember, pre about 1930, a lot of Jews in general changed names. So my mother's maiden name would have been Schwarz if World War One hadn't have had it changed to black for safety. So the problem is being Ashkenazi Jewish on that side is things sound German and we were at war with Germany, World War One and World War Two. So a lot of Jews with that kind of ancestry have had a little bit hidden for a very long time. But I don't remember not so from my childhood I was taught that yes it's going to be difficult being Jewish yes Australia has this bit of bigotry and it's your responsibility to handle it and to be publicly Jewish so other people don't have to so that was that was my family I mean for me I wasn't really hiding it I've never, I've never hidden it but I just never thought it was relevant or interesting um, and I was afraid people would be bored because I was a little bored by it I admit um, and, well, you see uh, you and I have you and I have non-Jewish names that occurred to me. Uh, I mean, I Phil Klatt, who was William Tenn, that was the, the pseudonym that he wrote under. I mean, a name like Klatt, you know, is obviously Jewish. So, so I, I have a I have a non-Jewish name too. Julian is is because this is partly because my family has been in Australia for so long. Um, and Polak can be equally Polish as Jewish. And yes, yeah, but, Polish but, but I'm Polish too. Poles get it. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they, they get the door shut. <laughs> and then I think I, um, I had the, the same experience as Gillian in, in some ways and Jason in others where, because uh, I grew up Orthodox uh, and I, and it was, uh, it was, would have, at least to people who, who knew what they were looking for, very obvious in how I dressed and that kind of thing. And as soon as I stopped uh, practicing Judaism in that way, I it was almost like a reflex to start just being loud about it verbally instead. Um, and I definitely like when I was, you know, I was writing from, from when I was in primary school and I, I thought, oh, no one would, I, I, what I want to write about, about Jewish things, that's so boring. It was, it was boring to me. Um, and it's only, yeah, starting to write about those topics. Uh, I think I started, I, I started writing about, about Jewish things in the same way that I wrote, started writing about queer things where it's like, oh, I'm going to do some good representation. And then, uh, it's like kind of, you uncover things about yourself as you, as you write them. So I like my, my practice of Judaism is not, uh, is, you know, nobody Orthodox would, would, uh, be fooled by it, but, um, it's, it's a more, uh, a more authentic practice for myself because of because of what I've written and how what I've been able to explore through my writing. When I was in primary school, I made a big decision. I made several. I decided I was going to be a writer, but I also decided that I was so sick of people bullying me because I'm Jew because of being Jewish that I would declare to absolutely everybody I ever met that I was Jewish so that they could walk away before the, it reached bullying stage. They could just avoid me. And I discovered that didn't work, but I've kept it up ever since because it be, it's such a long-standing habit. And there must be some people who avoid me because I'm Jewish. I don't have the honor of being Jewish, I don't know. Maybe you could address a little bit more how all of this, your identities intersect with your speculative fiction writing. I mean, uh, Jack and Rivka, you've, you've kind of addressed it already, but maybe uh, you could just elaborate on it a little bit because it's it's very noticeable and that's kind of the point of this this panel that you are speculative fiction writers rather than writers of, of realist fiction. Except well, I write realist speculative fiction and it's because I'm Jewish. It's the, the way we were taught to tell stories brought, fables weren't something separate 
stories about people being murdered weren't something separate. They were, oh, this is what happened to this cousin. This is what happened to that ancestor. We have this whole family story that starts off with, and, and your great great grandfather said kinder loaf to his children. It was with the, the Kishinev pogroms. And, and so I learned very early, you can't divorce the extraordinary from the, the minutiae of life. And so I thought I want to bring Judaism into that more directly. And all my novels, even the ones that aren't apparently Jewish, have uh, Jewish themes. Tikkun Olam is probably the most self-perpetuating theme in all of my writing. I, it's all about people who want to change the world, who want to do well, not for themselves, not to own the world, but to improve it for other people. And that's Jewishness. For me, it, for me, it's it's it is very personal. Uh, most of my writing is uh, well. I, I move through genres, so so it's it's it it's not all Jewish themes. But for me, writing is exploration. I explore how I feel about things, and since you know, I grew up in a small town. I was the only Jew. I experienced you know, quite a bit of anti-Semitism and was always fighting. I grew up with the sense that uh, I was always in danger. You know, I mean, I, come, I came from a different culture. I mean, I carried weapons, you know, from the time I was about 14. And my sense was that it doesn't matter if you're orthodox. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. It doesn't matter if you're conservative. People can perceive you as a Jew, they're going to point the same gun at you. And I felt and feel a need to what they call testify, to not let what happened during the Holocaust be forgotten. So there is a line of, of, uh, of stories which are collected in, in, in a collection called Concentration Camp that deal with the Holocaust by approaching this impossible tragedy through the lens of, uh, of, of fantasy and science fiction. And that's, that's my way of testifying. Um, the other thing that you can do with speculative fiction is uh, you can change, you can change things. You can, um, the, the people who are, have been missing from, from the narrative, from the, I guess the mainstream Jewish narrative, uh, you can write them into the story, which is a lot of what, what I'm doing, uh, particularly writing queer women into, into Jewish spaces in, in fiction. Um, but yeah, I think what Julian is saying is, is really, is really so accurate where the, the, and a, a, I think, I don't think that's unique to, to Jewish fiction. I think it's a lot of minority fiction is the same where the, the, the line between the, the fantastic and the, the real is, is much blurrier. Um, there's the, the Jewish folk tales that I grew up with have, uh, Napoleon appears in them and, if you, you know, you look at the, the history of these stories and it's like, you know, it was as Napoleon was moving into these places, he, he made his way into the stories because it was a great concern to, to the, the writers of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, and I, I don't write secondary, or I haven't so far written secondary worlds, everything is set here, but it's, there'll be something different about it that allows me to, uh, yeah, either either write write something into the story that's been ignored, or uh, really focus on on one particular thing and and magnify it um, uh, in a way where if you're trying to if you're trying to be too realistic, well, you can't always get those those marginal stories because it's not oh it's it's not you know this is the the constant claim of oh that's not realistic to have so many of this particular type of person in, in one story um, in, you know, in speculative fiction that you can, you can do whatever you want. 
as long as it's credible, as long as readers accept it. Jewish literary I mean, is, is fantastic. I mean, you know, I mean, Isaac Bathsheba Singer. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're storytellers and, uh, and, and, and we turn and twist things around. So uh, there's a lot of unrealistic in terms of, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the word that I want, but in terms of mimetic fiction. The, the Talmud is heavily story. The way we're taught religion is not the way other religions are taught. We're taught primarily through story. And one of my favorite pre-Yiddish, so late, late German books is the Maaseh book, which is written in Hebrew characters, but is German. And it's German folk tales told Jewishly by Jewish by Ashkenazi Jews in the 16th century. And I love that. It's two volumes in translation. I love it beyond anything. Jews read Talmud in Hebrew school and become lawyers because you 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 read about the law through examples and through stories. And, well, because uh, Talmud is law. So we exactly. are, a, we're not a religion of faith, where, although faith has its role, we are primarily a religion of law. And if you don't have a legal mind, it can get complicated. And I have, discovered very few Jewish speculative fiction writers who don't have that particular bend to their, it's not a Jewish bent, it's a legal bent to their, to their, their storytelling. I'm kind of the outlier on this one because in most of the stuff I've done that is explicitly Jewish, um, it's not speculative. You know, I did a, um, I did a Holocaust story as a, as a comic, which is, you know, realist fiction. Um, I did, um, I did a, um, alternate Sherlock Holmes story that was out earlier this year, which has a Japanese Sherlock and a Jewish Watson, which is set in apartheid South Africa in the seventies. Um, and otherwise I guess it's the six myths where, six um, myths. I, love I, the six myths. I, I don't think, I don't know. Does it count as speculative? I've changed yes, the Jews because to their, say their, their, their magic actually produces effects sometimes. Oh, there's no magic. There's no magic. So their, their rituals have, have, have consequences. Do, 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 does it? Well, I thought I did. Yeah. Maybe I need to go back and read it again. Well, I was I was deliberately ambiguous about it, but you know, I um, I don't know. Does it does it count? Like yes, I just I just kind of went. We're just going to say they're Satanists because that's funnier. <laughs> I, that was I actually funny. suspect that there are a lot of Jewish Australian writers who ask themselves, "What well, Jason? What you're asking? Does it count?" The reason I'm so loud about being Jewish is because I was active in Jewish organizations for 20 years. So I had a public Jewish face as well as my writer self. So I learned to explain, yes, it matters, but it's not that, that, that yes, it matters was not something I was born with or trained with within the family. It was something I learned from encountering the outside world. And we all have different encounters with the non-Jewish world. So we all learn different things. Oh, I had an encounter with a Jewish organization that didn't think it counted so you know it's i guess it's not just uh oh no they didn't think my writing counted they thought my leadership counted um and and so they were polite about my writing and now they think my writing counts it takes a long time to persuade people when you do something that's a bit different that that bit different is special well I, after i did wandering stars i didn't have a choice i mean people would just you know i'd say i'm jack dan and they say oh you did the jewish uh, anthology I remember I was I was uh, after my father died. I, I needed to to find a synagogue uh, to uh, in Philadelphia to uh, you know to pray because I, I you know I I was the eldest son, and so I, I I went to the synagogue and the rabbi you know was lovely. It was an Orthodox shul, and uh, asked me my name, and I told him who it was, and we ended up spending an hour you know, arguing about, uh, you know, ab about the, uh, you know, ab about the stories uh, in the book. So, so you're known for your being Jewish, whereas when people see my name, they say, oh, you wrote that medieval book. And people always want to ask me about Middle Ages. And I always tell them whether the toilets were in London, the public toilets were in London in the 12th century, just in case they time travel. But you're also known for food. Yeah. 
because the food is the, the, the comfortable thing for everybody. It's the thing I can use to talk about being Jewish, talk about being Australian, talk about being a historian. And I am an ethno historian. So food is a component of my research self. And it's the most comfortable component for the rest of the world. They're not really comfortable talking about ethno history unless it's food. So it's part of um, finding out what works when you have to be public about something. I guess I've just been a passive roustabout. Stuff just sort of happens to me. So, you know, I'm a Jewish writer. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, I don't really feel like I'm known for, for anything yet. But um, I, I think the, the, it's, the Jewish stuff is, is too, too much there to ignore. I think you and Jason are, are significantly younger, and I think that makes a difference. You've got, you've got time to do stuff, but you've also got the knowledge to avoid being labelled as the person who knows food or the person who wrote one, who, who edited Wandering Stars. Um, you can you can make it as an active choice, but it's it, it's something that doesn't hit until forties. And hey, man, I'd, I'd love to be 40. <laughs> I, I am 40. <laughs> so you're about, to, you're about to hit this moment in your life. It, I don't know whether to say you're lucky or it's, it's worrying. But until then, there's more. I have to explain just existing as a writer. Um, do you write? Why well, haven't I read your stuff? And I thought, and, and it just was really difficult. And now people know I'm a writer, but they're more interested in me as a medievalist. Your books in Dimex. Is it? I did not know that. So speaking of this idea of how literature has been used as like a label in the sense that like you label yourselves as Jewish writers and are labeled as Jewish writers, uh, how do you think that relates to kind of the label we've prescribed here as also Australian in particular? Do you think that there should be this kind of a national labeling or national canon? as it relates to literature, or do you think that things should be different nowadays because of uh, the transcultural identities that are constantly in flux and all of the increasing mobility and transfer in our world today? I have a really strong view on this one, so let everybody else go first. Oh, I think you should go first. I'm interested. Australian Jewish identity has changed significantly every 50 years or so. We've had an Australian Jewish identity since 1788. There have been Australian Jews, but it's never been a single identity. It's so I'm Anglo-Australian Jewish, even though my background is is um, seven eighths Ashkenazi. I'm I'm partly Sephardi, and that shows in what I do and what I think. Um, the English ancestry shows more than the other because anything prior to World War Two, Australian Jews were told to make themselves look English. Monash, who was our great leader in World War One, was. German Jewish and was made to had to present himself as English in culture. And when his Germanic culture came out, his actual German culture came out, people said, Oh, that's wrong, you are the enemy. And being Jewish and German Jewish caused him a lot of trouble. Um, so I part of the my cultural norm was standard until World War II. Then the Shoah survivor culture came in and shifted it. But prior to my family coming in, there was another Jewish culture entirely. So we do these giant shifts and all of us are equally Jewish at the same, it doesn't matter when we come, we're Australian Jewish. So if you say that there's one Australian Jewish culture, if you want to do a, a canon based upon that culture, you're going to pick one and leave the others out. And that doesn't represent who we are. You see, for me, a lot of people in the genre perceive, you know, my, my, my Jewishness because of those anthologies, but I write across genre. So, you know, I've written uh, historical novels and the idea of me being Jew, it doesn't cross over. So, uh, I mean, I've never found it to be an impediment, I guess, if that makes any sense. Uh, but I've never, I've never stuck to one genre. So I, I see a lot of the categorization, you know, is, is basically marketing where, where you end up in a, in, in a bookstore, how you're perceived, are you perceived as a genre writer? So if you're perceived as a genre writer, that could affect uh, you being able to uh, 
to step over into uh, you know into the into the high art market, which is why a lot of people, which is why Vonnegut and uh, and Harlan Ellison, may he rest in peace, uh, would would not you know refuse to be called science fiction writers. I think in terms of uh, the, I guess the the intersection between the place and and Jewishness, um, uh, what Julian says is absolutely true. Where it's it's not it's not a, a monolith by any means. The it's not, uh, I'm sorry, it's, still, it's not a monolith. The Jewish right. the, the Jewish Australian experience. Um, I still remember uh, Gillian uh, signed her copy of the the wizardry of Jewish women at my copy of it. Uh, Please don't throw this book against the wall because after I'd already bought it and handed it over to her, she just kind of realized that some of what she was describing in the book was, I would describe it as almost like a mirror of some of my experiences. It, it, It wasn't exactly my experience, but it, it also, she she just realized that how it was potentially like something that if the the wrong kind of person could get upset about it, which I I didn't I I love that book, but um yeah I think at the same time I do feel like that you the the place where you're living and writing um it, it has to affect what what you're doing unless you're unless you're writing the most you know derivative formulaic kind of work even if your story is a, is, is a second world uh secondary world or um not set in australia some of that is going to um come across somewhere uh whether it's the the tone or the the realization or um the place even if it's not australia there's there's particular things about australia that uh like the, the whole kind of Australian Gothic uh, thing. And you, know, you could have a whole separate panel on about how that uh, is affected by colonialism itself. Um, so, yeah, I think that, I think the place is very important. And I think you know, certainly pre-internet, it was such a barrier to, to have to, um, you know, send, send work by post to, to the US to, to get published and there's writers here who are like I, I can't afford this if i cash this check I'll, I'll owe money to the bank because i got paid ten dollars for the story and it's thirty dollars to um to uh to, to cash the check in in australia and i i, I do think you you can't have those kind of experiences and not not have that effect you're writing either whether it's yeah trying to mimic what what's acceptable overseas or just uh, I think like possibly what all of us have done is just say no nope, I'm just gonna write what I write and uh, just march to the beat of my own drum because chances are they're gonna kind of scratch their heads and not get it anyway even no matter how hard I try so I might yeah, I, I still I think do. that's changed uh, I mean uh, you know that's that's why my, my partner and I did the Dreaming Down Under uh, volume because there's so much wonderful stuff here and it wasn't on the radar in England or, or in the U.S. But we are on the radar now. I, I realize it's still a pain in the neck when you get a ten dollar check if you don't have an American bank. But uh, you know, but I believe that we that we are uh, we are recognized now. Uh, and I think Australian writers are, you know, are being published in the U.S. and in and Great Britain. I mean, it's a hard slog. I mean, this period now, with the, uh, uh, you know, with the shrinking of the commercial publisher, has made it tough on everybody because of the, uh, you know, th- there's basically no mid list, and uh, and that affects, you know, that affects the income, you know, that affects a lot of people's income. But uh, but I I I do think we're I do think I do think we're seeing. I, I had a question for everybody: Is Jewish literature perceived as basically being international? You know, somewhat like the way people perceive science fiction. I mean, I know it's, it's very different in each country, but 
So I did some research on that specifically for Australia a few years ago and okay. reeled back in horror and never want to look at it again. So I've, I've, I gave a couple of conference papers about it, but never wrote it up for anything because I discovered that Australian literature accepts Jewish, so we're talking about the major publishers here, accepts Jewish works that are about the Holocaust or about ultra-Orthodox communities and everything else falls out of the picture if it's fiction. And, and we've all seen it, which is such a big pattern. And then when you look at historical fiction, historical fiction, you can have occasional Jewish minor characters. You cannot have Jewish major characters until the last couple of years. So Bram Press has written, um, so I, I, was in, I, I moderated a panel at the Historical Novel Society and two of the three writers were Jewish and had Jewish main characters. But Tim Ellis, his main character was a hidden Jew, a very major figure in history, but a hidden Jew. So again, we're talking, and, and, and Bram's book was the Holocaust. So again, we're talking about certain ways of talking about Jews are okay. And speculative fiction is breaking those boundaries, but not in a big way. There are only a few of us who are doing it. So again, Australia doesn't match what any other country's doing. Not even New Zealand in this case. I do think there's also a, a big, uh, internationally, there's the, the American Jewish world is the, the dominant paradigm. And when people, when people imagine Jewish people, they imagine, an, you know, Seinfeld or like, yeah, an American and New, specifically a, a, probably a New York, a New York American Jew. And, um, that's obviously not everybody's experience it is mine but it is <laughs> not anyone else's here <laughs> you're, you're the minority here jack it's, it's also the, the you know the new yorker idea of literature which, which was which was very jewish yeah i think this you this leads on fairly well to <laughs> to what i would like to ask of jason because because it ties in with this perception of of american jewishness because you, Jason, you said that you only started identifying as an Australian writer once you went to the US. So that, that must have given you a kind of insight into this question of nationality and how it intersects with your other identities. Well, it was very much a case of it was getting too complicated <laughs> to explain. Um, and they're like, where's that accent from? When I go, oh, it's Australian. Um, and then, um, yeah, you know, I started, um, it was when I started working in comics and, um, the first artist that I really collaborated with, um, was Australian. Um, and that just kind of how it, how it, um, took shape. It was, it was, um, I guess accidental as much as anything. Did you feel that, did you feel like, that, like what you were writing was that different? Uh, yeah. So look, a lot of my writing is not set in Australia. Um, some of it is and a lot of it's set in, in the States, you know, my, um, my first novel is set mostly in California. Um, my last novel was set kind of New York and London. Um, it just depends on what the story is, whether I set it here and whether it's, it's Australian, you know, I, I did a South African story for the first time, um, last year, that, that Sherlock Holmes story, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I've definitely had comments that, um, there's an Australian quality to some of my work that's not set here that I wasn't aware of. Sometimes just in the vocabulary, you know, I, I said holiday instead of vacation in, in a couple of spots, um, which I wasn't aware of, but it's certainly not deliberate. I actually, can I ask when, so when I've read, read your novels, which is, I have read them, um, I see your settings on this earth as often portals rather than, so they're places from which things happen even when you get quite specific and the setting's quite clear, that's still a, a place from which something happens. Is this intentional or just my reading of it again? I've lived in a bunch of different places mm. and I've traveled a fair bit. And I you mean, know, my next, my new book that's coming out next year is about travel. Um, so yeah, it's, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. We've kind of uh, navigated around this a little bit, but uh, also if you do, have writings where you address uh, your Jewish culture, heritage, or religion. And uh, for example, Jason, 
you do it specifically in the comic book, uh, The Six Myths, and we discussed whether that would count as speculative or not. Um, I would say yes, because speculative doesn't have to have magic, but I would just like you to, to discuss your writing with each other. All of you are having so many different ways of incorporating your culture into your speculative fiction writing, and I just think it would be interesting to have you chat about that. Um, I mean, the six myths is just me kind of mining, you know, my experiences growing up in a, you know, Jewish community in, in Australia or a part of that community and mining it for comedy. I mean, that's really all it, all it was. I was just going like, what was, what was funny? What would be, it'd be more funny if, if they were, um, Satanists and that's, that's the joke really. Um, it has been interesting how few people have picked up what's going on there if they didn't grow up in that community. Um, but I'm kind of proud of that as well. Remember when I commented on it and you said, oh, you noticed. <laughs> yeah, you. The story um, always has to work. It has to work if people don't know the references. That's, that's part of the challenge, I think. The challenge of alternate history, uh, which I, I, I I've, I've, I've written quite a bit of, for me, as I said before, it's, it's, it's asking questions. Like I, I, you know, I was, I was, I was asking the question, can people change? Is, can people really change? So I wrote a, a, a story called the economy of light, which basically took me 20 years to write because I started it and then couldn't finish it. But I was, I was asking, what if Mangala had turned, uh, uh, we've talked about this before amongst ourselves, what if Mengele had turned into a, Schwe uh, a Schweitzer living in South America? Uh, is, would he be, is that a, would, would he be, a, is that a different person or, or, or is that, how, how do you carry what you've done in the past? Uh, and so my protagonist, uh, who, who was in the camp and, and was one of Mengele's children goes after him to look for him and finds him. And the question I had, what do you do? Would you, would you, would you kill this, this person who's, who, who's, who's murdered all the people, you know, etc., Or do you treat this person as, as someone entirely new? And I asked the question in another story. I wrote a story called Tea about an old lady who has tea every Wednesday with this man. And it turns out that he was a war criminal. And she's an Orthodox Jew. And I asked the question, what does she do? Well, she still had tea with him. That makes sense because I had a student who was the grandchild of a war criminal. And I was the one she confessed to in the front in front of the whole class. And you still have to do what you do. Is it's up to you how you react to it. And I react to it with, she hasn't killed anybody. It was her grandfather. But I have to deal with this so no one gets hurt. And what I did then, that's where the green children came from. That class taught me that I hadn't addressed my reactions to everyone, to everything. And I did a, what an historian's going to do with it, I guess. I said, what would happen what, what have we lost with these people? If, so, if 100 or 200,000 of them lived and made a community, what kind of community would they make? And that's how I invented Sarfat, which is the pocket universe under, under contemporary France. And that's, they produce superheroes. See, this is how we, I mean, we write to work this stuff out, I think, or, or, or I should say I do anyway. Uh, and, and that's the joy because you don't know, you don't, you don't know the answers. I mean, I had written somewhere that, that for me, you know, you know, writing is the journey is the discovery. And that became a meme. I mean, I, you know, it, it like appeared all over the place, but I don't, I, I, I don't always know how, how, a, you know, I mean, I wrote the, the Da Vinci novel to, 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 to ask the question, what would Da Vinci do if all of his engines of war could be made real and he could see the devastation? 
how would you know how would he respond and i wrote uh uh the memory cathedral to find out i didn't i didn't know how it ended until it ended. It ended. i think that's one of the reasons we are speculative fiction writers to be honest because we can tell just fun stories because it's fun to tell just fun stories but we can also say, but I need to know this, I need to understand it, and I don't need to take it on personally. I don't need the weight that other people carry when they spend their life trying to figure this out. Let me tell us a story. And because we're Jewish, we've been taught how to tell important stuff through story. We've got the method for sorting things out in our mind from our background. We don't always know it, we don't always use it directly, but it's there lurking. Yes, I, I, I agree. And we also can use humor to talk about stuff that that is very that, that's hurtful, dangerous, harmful and 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 uh, and hard to talk about. And being Australian, we call a spade a bloody shovel, which means we don't say we can't talk about this. It could hurt someone. We say, how could we talk about this? And if we make it funny, we, that's even better. But we don't say we can't talk about the subjects that hurt too much. We ask, how can we talk about them? And that's such an Australian thing. Are we, are you, yeah. are we all in agreement here? <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm often, I guess, doing, doing a different thing in each story. Um, but it's, yeah, you, you do, you sort of look back and then you start seeing things after a while. But yeah, I'm often, uh, I guess, very frustrated by like the, like particularly in, in film and television where the, anything orthodox, the only and especially, and especially like women's stories, pretty much the only thing you have is women who are oppressed and and dissatisfied and um, and if they if they try to like break free at all, they get disowned by their families and all of that kind of thing. And uh, it, it feels like well, nobody's nobody's interested in you know queer women in those communities who their parents have accepted that, um, which is my experience. Like it's, you know, I haven't, I haven't been disowned for my, for my preferences. And, uh, that's not, that's not exciting enough, but, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, in some ways it is like you use the speculative fiction to, to make it to make the story feel more like, oh, well, some of, some of the Jewish stuff is not necessarily melodramatic. Um, it's the Jewish, the Jewish side of it might be, uh, just normal and the, the speculative, uh, stuff is what's, is what provides the, the conflict and the drama. Um, but then yeah, other times it's, I guess, playing with what, what I feel like Judaism could, could be, uh, what it's becoming, what it has been, um, that, that it's, yeah, kind of, yeah, something, something different in every, in every story, really. I like it when you use, well, I like your Dybbuk story because Dybbuk's, most Dybbuk stories I've read have, um, they're about Christian demonization. They don't actually follow the, the Jewish model, which is different, which has chal different challenges. And you actually stuck very strictly to the letter of the law with the, and that gave it a very different slant. I liked that. Yeah. Speaking that, of, yeah. of this, the different forms uh, that have been used as well. So like, uh, not just the different ways that uh, writing can be figured, but also the different forms that you all engage with, uh, whether it is short stories, novels, or graphic novels. Uh, is there anything for you as individuals particularly that you like about the forms that you choose to write in? Uh, would you consider experimenting with different forms that you've never written in before, or are you kind of fixed in your forms? And uh, we can start with Jason because I think he has a lot to say on this. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, look, I guess I started in prose. Um, I've tried, um, I guess, pretty much every, 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 every form there is because um, I just... Uh, 
like when we experimented, yeah. I guess, in that way. Um, I spent a fair bit of time thinking about doing film, and then uh, I have a cousin who works uh, peripherally in the in the film industry in LA, and I heard some stories from him, and I was like, I'm not putting up with that. I'm not, don't want to have a career where I, I spend my time writing films that never get made, and I think that was a good decision. You know, I, I guess I, I fell into comics um, when it was accidental, but um, it was an online community that I was in. That was um, kind of where I met the first artist that I started working with um, after having attempted to, you know, produce some comics of my own when I was at, at, at university um, and being dissatisfied with uh, the way that they looked. So um, fi finding an artist to work with, that was a, that was a huge, huge deal for me. Um, and, um, you know, for a while, my output was kind of more comics and then it became a bit more 50-50. Now it's gone probably back towards prose more just because there's less um, project management in terms of getting a, a, a book or a short story out than a comic, you know, especially since my son was born. Um, you know, that the, uh, time investment has been difficult. Um, Ideally, that I'd like to be 50-50. I think I'm happy with those two media, and it very much depends what the story is, whether I want it to be um, something that's more visual, or, you know, whether I think it's going to work better in prose. Um, that's just really the main consideration I, I would have. One of my regrets is I had a chance to write for Howard the Duck, and I turned it down, oh. and I've always regretted that. I'm the opposite. I discovered very early on that either I can write well or I can write like I, I'm not, I don't have the gift of writing in standard form and doing it well. I have to, this unique voice is because I don't have a choice if I want to write at all reasonably. For some reason, even when I write essays, they're appalling when I try to write like anybody else. It's just a thing that I discovered very early on and it applies to my fiction. So if I have something to say, I try to find the best form to say it for my voice. And that's normally novel, but not always novel. When I was a teenager, I wrote poetry, and that was terrific for what I had to say then. It doesn't work for the really strange interweaving ideas I have now. Um, and it's, I, I, think, I think the year of the fruitcake is where I showed that was a, for, a very clear decision that I could not tell it with a standard structure. I had to do an unusual structure because I had to make it really clear what was happening for anybody who could deal with that particular sequence. And so I went with my voice and then structured, a, say, what can I do with this to, to, to give this outcome? And that's what I do with every novel. I do study genre. It's one of the things I, I research. And so yeah, the, the genre is part of the analysis that says, within genre, what things will work for this, that, and the other. But it's pushing genre all the time. I'm, I'm subversive by nature, I suspect. I've never seen you structure this two books the same way, Julian. As I said, I'm subversive by nature. You know, one thing I learned, I, I've done a lot of workshops, and it, it's what makes talking about writing so difficult, because Writers are so extraordinarily different in the way they approach how they work. Uh, I was moderating a panel once, and uh, it, it, there was, I think, six or seven other successful writers on it. And one would plot, before he started a novel, he would plot every single scene. Another basically had ideas in a bowl and would pick an idea and then start and that would you know be and be become the novel my you know my partner Janine will 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 start writing in the middle of the book I've got to start at the beginning and work forward so it's we all work so differently that it it's 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 very difficult to uh it's very difficult to talk about it. I, I mean, what I tell people when I'm conducting a workshop, if everything I say sounds wrong to you, it's not you. I'm not your guy. Uh, how do you guys work? I mean, do you... Well, I'm primarily a short story writer. Um, I, I, think, I think for me, it's um, partly just if you're not 
you have to cons whatever form you want to work in you have to be consuming that form you have to be reading it or watching it or whatever the, the case may be and yeah i've just i've always read a lot of short stories i they just i what what i really like is when the story is the right length so a lot of a lot of epic fantasy if it's good then fantastic if it feels that if it feels that how many hundred pages and that's great but if it's not that great and it feels like it's padded out and it could have been half the size then i find that very frustrating and there are a lot of a lot of ideas that they belong in a short story they don't belong in anything longer than than that um and you know i'll have people ask, oh why don't you write more of this why don't you write a novel of this and i'm like because there isn't a novel there that just isn't it's, that's that's what there is that's there's nothing else um and yeah i've got one one novel like in in progress and it, it is a lot of fun to be able to really dig deeper into into the themes and the characters and that kind of thing but i i don't know how many novels i have in me i've been working on that for more than 10 years on and off at this point so i don't know if any of yeah. us know how many novels we have in us no. That's you it. discover That's you fun. have that novel in you when you're writing that novel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. But yeah, in terms of other other forms, like I, I'm I'm not very visual, so I don't really like like I'll look at a comic and go, "Oh, that's pretty," but I don't read them very often because I don't quite know how they work. Um, so that would like. I would have to learn how they work to write one otherwise it would be terrible i'm sure um so yeah not really uh not really something i've ever thought about and then you know i would i would love to, you know if someone if someone wants to adapt my work into a film or television that would be great but i'm not going to be involved because i would just get in the way like i wouldn't know the first thing so um yeah i think yeah i think short stories are my main my main comfort zone and then then novels just kind of happen at a glacial pace alongside them i started i mean i love short stories i think it's 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 an extraordinarily difficult form because you have to do everything uh that you do in a novel in a sense in in you know in such a it, it's closer to poetry i think but my stories just kept getting longer and longer i tried writing a novel early on and absolutely didn't work although a buddy of mine turned it into a short story and we sold it to nature believe it or not but the stories just got longer and longer and longer until i realized i was you know that i was i was becoming a novelist i think some people start off writing long form and and then there are writers like us who you know, who want to write these jeweled, you know, you know, short stories. And one of the best speculative fiction short story writers, Avram Davison, only wrote well in short form. No, his, yeah, his short stories were lovely. Although, uh, well, the problem is, is that he'd start these enormous projects, novel projects, and he'd write the first novel and then get bored. But the short stories are gems, and 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 uh, I wish I, wanna, I wrote short I, stories that well. I can write short stories reasonably well, but I write novels better. I will not name names, but there are definitely there are many novelists, the many authors who I love their short stories, and I can't get through their novels. Like, yeah. And well. some people can write all forms, but. The thing about writers is that we are unique. That's what makes our writing readable, is the fact that we don't write the same things. So it makes sense that we don't approach writing the same way or that we don't write in the same forms. And we write at different paces. I mean, I've done a lot of collaboration with Barry Malsberg. Well, Barry can write a novel on the weekend. So I say, let's, let's, I, I, I say, let's, do a, let's do a short story about this. And he says, I, okay. So I'll give him the idea. And like a couple of days later, he comes back with all this stuff, which I then start putting together. After two weeks, he says, where is it? I said, well, you know, I've got to write it. I'm working, you know, I'm working through it. And there's a lot of writers who are just naturally extraordinarily prolific. 
when you start to compare writer with writer on those grounds, it's false comparison because we're not doing the same things at all. Yeah, you, so the you proper don't. comparison is you find two writers who are writing similar types of work and you compare the words produced. I think of, you know, I think of someone like Salinger who had a, a small oeuvre of, you know, of, of wonderful stuff. It just depends on the kind, you know, on the kind of, uh, on the kind of writer you are. I mean, in the old days, a buddy of mine was, uh, was Tom Scorcher, may rest in peace. And, that was before computers. And what he would do is he had, he would have a roll of like uh, paper on the, this enormous roll. And he would, it, it would go through his, his, his typewriter so that he wouldn't have to stop to do the pages. Those are so many different perspectives on, on various ways of, of writing. And I wish that we had the time to continue just listening to that. But I'm afraid if we want to have a little bit of time left for the Q&A, we'll have to move on to our last question. That is the last question from Lucas and I. And basically, we wanted to know how, as Australian writers, you engage with the country's history, uh, its colonial history, its convict history, other forms of history. I know that, uh, Rivka, you mentioned uh, both your short stories and also your novel, I, I believe, drawing on history. And of course, with Jillian and also Jack, it's very obvious. So uh, how, how do you engage with that? Yeah, I, it was actually, I had a long break from writing from when I finished my master's while I was having kids um, until about 2013. And the first thing that I wrote when I, uh, when I started writing again was, was a, and like it was alternate history, a uh, convict short story, um, uh, beyond the factory walls. And I, I think at first I wasn't, I wasn't really engaging with colonialism. I really only got to, to that when I started, like it, it I, I basically, I wrote the story and I thought, oh, if this works out, it can like kind of be the first chapter of a novel, um, which it actually, it's sort of in a different part of the novel and it it's told differently. There's no magic in the novel and there was in the short story. Uh, but uh, yeah, as I wrote it and also, um, I guess, learned from uh, different different writers like um, Claire Coleman and Amblin Quay Malina uh, about how to engage with, with Aboriginal uh, history and culture in fiction and what was you know, completely off limits and what, what was good to do and what, what really struck me as, as I learned was just, just ignoring it, uh, is possibly the worst thing to do. Um, and so I, there's a lot of things in the novel that I'm very nervous about and obviously we'll, we'll have, you know, sensitivity reading and all that kind of thing when it's ready. But, um, yeah, I think, uh, basically that, that setting is all, it's an alternate history where the, the dominant culture is, uh, I guess, more Jewish than, uh, than well, it's, it's kind of like a mixture of Jewish and Christian because I, I wanted it to still seem like real, but also not real. And part of what I want to explore in it is the, I guess, the idea that, that we, everybody has that potential to to be an oppressor and uh, at, now that I'm studying psychology that's kind of come through again I you know doing um, doing social psychology and the, the early social psychologists were just they were desperately trying to prove that the the Holocaust was not an anomaly and that really nobody's really like that it was just that one uh, one thing and they were completely incorrect like the you know, that research does not, does not play that out. It pretty much, uh, not everybody, but like broadly speaking, everybody has that, that potential. And I, I think when you are a minority, it's very easy to, to say, oh, well, you know, I'm a minority. I've never, I've never oppressed anybody. I've never hurt anybody, but that's, you know, when we're, uh, at least, uh, I am still, you know, Western culture, I'm still white. Um, 
and being Jewish does not cancel those things out. So that that's really uh, where that that uh, I guess sort of bigger project is is going. I was thinking I had two apprenticeships. One was with my mother. She was a science and geology teacher. So our holidays were often tests of her excursions. And so I learned to see the landscape and to read the landscape from very early on. And so all my novels are based upon actual land. I can't not see the land. I have to know what rocks are underneath. I have to know what water systems are there. I can't ignore the land. And then um, I edited a short story for the anthology Baggage and it was Yauchi Green's short story. And she said, I'm not doing this unless we can do it properly and get permissions for all the cultural elements. And she's she used her family. Um, and so the group of, El she had two groups of cultural informants apart from herself. She had her cousins who checked everything. And then she had the elders who checked everything very carefully. And that taught me that what I do as a Jewish Australian is actually not that dissimilar to what she has to do as an Indigenous Australian and check for all the ramifications of everything. Check that it's a culture thing that can be shared without anybody being hurt or without the, the underlying culture being damaged. Check that it's understandable by the readers and check that it fits everyone's needs, absolutely everyone's needs. And that taught me that isn't enough to see the land and observe it. It isn't enough to see country, to respect it. You also have to know how we live on it and how people see that they live on it. And that makes it much harder to write, but it means that a lot of thought goes into all my writing because those apprenticeships are things I can't forget without being ethically dubious myself. So you're right, Rivka, we all have it in us. We have to make these decisions to say, I have to do this thing in this way, because otherwise I'm hurting people the way I don't want to be hurt. And having said that, I'm very rude about Christianity in all my novels, so I'm not consistent. So look, I mean, I guess uh, I'm a South African originally, so, uh, you know, I've seen, seen some of this up, up close. Um, and, you know, I, I think Gillian's pointed out that uh, a thing that you see a lot in my work is somebody shows up and ruins a place. Um, so I guess my, my novel Fairy Apocalypse is, is basically about this, um, you know, various configurations of humans travel to this, this fairy world and, and, and ruin it. You know, bring in like foreign magic or technology or, you know, that turn its rules against itself in a kind of sort of bad faith interpretation of what's going on. You know, it, it kind of looks at the subjectivity of the, the, the native people, the, the, the fairy people who live there. Um, you know, it has one of the characters who, who kind of, you know, puts himself up as a, as a sort of savior while he has gone and destroyed the culture, destroyed, you know, the, the forces that govern the place. Um, and then he stands up a pair of unqualified dictators to, to, to take over. A book that's coming out next year in, in that book you'll see that um you know the kind of result of that is that it, it becomes a kind of tourist trap yeah i don't know like it, it's a thing that i do in, in various configurations quite a lot but i guess quite explicitly in that in that that book well when i've written about the other uh usually it's it's out of my ex it comes out of my experience uh uh I've written about, uh, I've had Na Native American protagonists and I did enormous amounts of research and I ceremony with Sioux people who, who basically uh, did not tolerate wannabes and I got involved with it because one of my, one of my close pals was uh, uh, was becoming a medicine man. And I wrote a series of poems uh, about those experiences. And what I did is I had it vetted by a medicine woman. I wouldn't just, you know, it, you know, it's a, it's a question. It was a question of respect. You know, it, it's a good, I was thinking of, of living here in Australia and using the, 
the geography, culture, etc. I mean, for anything I write, I, I dig as deep as I can into the mindset. And because I think a writer has to know 10 times as much as ever appears on, on the page. But it's taken me 20 years. I mean, it's, it's like a natural kind of thing. Before I found myself writing using the Australian uh, background experience and uh, and and that just <clears throat> that just that just came naturally I could I, I couldn't it would be like forcing the novel as Risco was talking about you you gave me one of the you let me have you didn't give me um, one of the poems for baggage that was that anthology, I'll never be so lucky with anything editing. I had the best of work and it all gave those insights into what it is to be Australian. And I found it was really interesting that you chose that poem. And now I know why you weren't ready to write an Australian short story at that stage. Yeah. Which is a fair decision. And it's a lovely poem. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for answering. Tina and, and my questions, uh, we'd like to open it up now to uh, our various uh, audience, so to speak, for any questions they might have. So if you would like to ask a question, please indicate by raising your hand with the feature uh, and we will uh, hopefully get to you. How do you experience being pushed to represent a specific aspect of identity, often trauma related, even if that has nothing to do with your actual writing? Can I go first, get out of the way, because that's how I deal with it. Um, this, because we were the only Jewish family in our primary school, we were one of two Jewish families in, in the high school, I've been put on the spot with these questions all my life. Since the time I was about eight, I've been asked to define the Holocaust. I've been asked to talk about anti-Semitism. When I was six, I, just, I saw my first pile of bodies from it, as in the pictures of it. So this is not something new for me. And it's never something straightforward, but it doesn't traumatize me anymore because I've had, I'm 60. We're talking about 50 something years of dealing with everyone assuming that the first Jewish person they meet is going to explain the Holocaust to them and explain lacrimose Jewish history and all the persecutions. And because I'm medievalist, I've had to explain 1290, I've had to explain 4092, I've had, I've had to explain 1307. If there has been an expulsion, someone's asked me about it and I've got all the usual things like, you must be doing something wrong or why are you Jewish or wouldn't it be easier not to be Jewish and all the things. And um, I've been personally accused of killing Christ. I have been personally accused of, of drinking baby's blood. All the regular prejudices have come my way at various times. And it is just, a not, it's not a comfortable part of my life, but it's an ordinary part of my life. It doesn't happen to me very often uh, now. Uh, I simply don't put up with it. Uh, unfortunately, I once met a guy like me. I was with a couple of friends and I was doing Jewish shtick and he thought I was putting, putting down Jews. Well, he actually followed me around and, uh, and, and accosted me. And I had to say, look, buddy, I, I, I'm Jewish. That was shtick. You, you've got this wrong. People don't, don't don't approach me anymore in that way, but uh, but I I have uh, you know I, I grew up uh, you know dealing with uh, with antisemitism. I still remember signs: "No Jews or dogs allowed." Uh, in fact, when I bought my second house, which was built in the 1880s. Uh, the contract had stated and, and it, it, you know this was on the property since it was formed that that it could not be sold to a black or a jew so i i i, I took that clause out but uh but no i just don't tolerate it i mean if i if if, if i if someone makes an anti-Semitic statement in passing and i hear it i call I, i'll call that person on it right then and there I give detailed historical explanations, which is actually just as effective as calling out because some people actually want to know and they don't know that they're carrying baggage and inflicting harm. And the other people, nothing shuts people up better than an historian talking for, for 10 minutes after you've said three words. 
Yes, well, you're a better person than me. I mean, I figure, you know, you say something nasty, you know, you know, screw you, buddy, you know. I wish I could do that. It would be more effective. But my way is still, it mostly works. No, yours is a better way. But I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't know. You know what? I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure. Rivka, do you get asked this? Um, I, I think I don't get asked it as much. I do, I do occasionally see, um, uh, I guess, yeah, questions that are kind of really uncalled for of like, yeah, the, the, yeah, what did you do to deserve all of this is a, is a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty common one. And I think, uh, my approach is, is generally, a you know, do you really think that's an appropriate question to ask? Um, and I think, uh, not when I'm, not when it's presented as a question like that, but more broadly in my work, I'm, and just in how I, not even like in my fiction, but how I speak about Jewishness is just kind of trying to, uh, I, I guess, present that actually that's not, that's not the, the sum total of Judaism because we, there is, uh, that's, we're, we're, we're not only our suffering, we have like our joy and our scholarship and our history and, and so many other things that uh, actually, uh, not that we shouldn't ever focus on that, but it shouldn't be all that we focus on. You should listen to them, not me. <laughs> There's a, a, a description of history, which is currently out of date, thank goodness which is lacrimose for, for Jewish history, which is we're all about the tears. And that's something that's been put on us by historians. It is not actually our history. It's saying that the only time you can have, you know, those, those um, adventure stories we were kids where the only things you learned were the adventures. The Narnia thing where, where C.S. Lewis said, there's stuff happened between all these big events, you know, you were just not called in for them. It's as if Jewish history is described by non-Jews as, and some Jews, as the lachrymose thing, where it's only the veil of tears. And the truth is, the everyday matters more, because that's what we actually live. And some, when the everyday is obliterated by suffering, that's not lachrymose, that's the everyday being, being obliterated by suffering. Well, it's also the Jewish caricature, which has been you know, unfortunately, part of Western culture, you know, for, you know, for centuries, I mean, you know, Shakespeare, you know, you know, writing about the, you know, the, you know, about the Jew and the hook nose and all, and, and, and all of this. Uh, I think for a time, Israel changed that with the idea of, of, of Jews being bellicose. And then, of course, that soured terribly when, uh, when the Jews turned, uh, when the Jewish state started turning uh, uh, Palestine into the new Jews. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a particular aspect of that that's Australian. Does anybody remember the Great Federation Parade in, in 2001, 2002, where Sydney had this big parade which was celebrating Federation? So by the early 21st century, we'd had two Jewish governors general with John Monash, we'd had a truckload of Jewish entertainers and the only Jewish presence in that parade were 30 something face people with masks, black face masks from Mo, Roy Reen, a, a comedian who is very dated because of the blackface, so problematic because of the blackface. And they thought this was the best way to represent a hundred, odd years of Australian Jewish history, 200 odd years of Australian Jewish history. I was wondering, you've said so much about how you yourselves feel about the label Jewish Australian and how it sometimes enters your work. And beyond that, perhaps burden of representation that Borju has mentioned, I find myself wondering if it works in your favor sometimes on the global literary marketplace um, to, to market yourself or to allow others to market you as Jewish Australian, whether it works against you or whether it has no effect at all. Well, Rivka and I have both recently had experience of that um, because last year we both got the Dikmas, Rivka for her story, me for the novel. 
and they were presented on Rosh Hashanah, so neither of us could go there. Imagine having your award presented on Christmas Day. It's kind of a, a, a problem. Um, but since then, people started noticing that there were Jewish Australian writers because of that. And so we're more visible, not a lot more visible, but more visible than we have been for the weirdest reason. Not because of our writing, but because of when the award was presented. I think we, um, I think we both had the same person accepting on our behalf if I'm remembering correctly, and she made a point of mentioning it at every possible opportunity on on uh, Twitter, which I, I really appreciated. Um, Yarachi accepted for me. Okay, it was Elizabeth accepted for me. She must have. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's one of my close friends, yeah. so yes, it makes sense that she also talked about she me. She mentioned it for someone else apart from me, but now I can't remember who it was. Um, but yeah that that was uh, yeah I, I don't know if that um really had an effect for my career personally i did what i what i have kind of wondered is is how things will go when uh because that that story that one was set in new york it wasn't set in australia um and i'm yeah i'm, I'm interested to see what the reception will be uh when i have stories uh, that are set in Australia and are published overseas, um, which will will be happening. Uh, we don't know when the when other covenants is gonna is gonna come out, but in the next couple of years, it'll be really interesting to see how they respond to that. I I don't I I think both labels can be both. Uh, a plus and a minus, depending on the um, depending on the situation and depending on the, the the people. Some people say that they're very interested in reading Australian fiction, but they don't ever actually follow through with it. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think I think Jewish things uh, it kind of depends what it is. It can be it can be difficult for. So uh, my new novel is published in America, and it is a very Jewish theme. Um, it is the superhero one with the alternate underground France thing. Mm -hmm. And and that's, but one of the reasons it was published in America was Jason and I were talking about what happened at the Didmars. And Jason said, I know a publisher. And, and so it's a Jewish American publisher, which is a, specifically a Jewish imprint. And, and that would not have, it's a strange indirect way of happening, but that's how the science fiction world operates. It would not have happened if Jason and I hadn't have had that conversation, and we had that conversation because of the Ditmars. If Dylan introduced him to me, so thanks, Steve. Well, I, I'm probably out of this one because I think I'm probably still perceived as an American writer. Yeah. Um, for me, you need I to change your that. accent for when you visit America next. Yeah, right. I don't think I've seen it seen a difference in, in my career, but um, maybe I haven't written very much that's very identifiably Australian or Jewish. And also you mix in a different set for your writing because the comics industry is completely different in how it's shaped. But yeah, and it's you know, there's there's not much of it over here in Australia. Mm. We're down to I think one publisher now. IFWG is getting into the business now. They're doing a graphic novel of one of my short stories, but that I did with Barry uh, Malsberg. But I wanted to ask you, ask, ask you this. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that all the action is in the, is, is in the states for graphic novels, isn't it? Or and maybe Great Britain? I don't know. Yeah, unless you're doing children's children's work. Um, I, I'm involved with IWG as well. Probably surprising. To one. <laughs> so um, am I. Oddly. And, um, yeah, um, and you know, the, the focus of that, that effort is going to be, um, you know, the American direct market. Yeah. Because I, no way to... I'm sorry, I probably yeah. threw things off here by, you know, asking my own question. It's, sorry. Actually, it's actually helped everybody understand that the Australian speculative fiction communities is as much community as industry. 
and that it matters that we know each other. Uh, I think it's me. It's very interesting that you brought up the graphic novels, especially because I am I am looking at Australian speculative fiction graphic novels for a, a new part of our seminar that I'm preparing. So there are some, there are especially some Aboriginal graphic novels coming out. There's Brenton McKenna with Abby's Underdogs, and he has been involved in uh, promoting younger uh, Aboriginal graphic novel artists. So that there's definitely something happening on that front. Yes, thank you so much for this very, very engaging discussion. Uh, is there any last words that you would like to address to our audience, to us? Big thank you to Tina and Lucas for organizing yes, it and putting up with all the questions and uh, hosting us. It's been great. Um, <laughs> if you've got any more questions for me, by the way, especially about the comic side of things, if you'd like to hit me up with an email or whatever, please feel free, don't hesitate. And we are on Twitter and Facebook. If you beeped all of us at once, if there's a question you, all, you want us all to answer, I suspect we might be able to. Yeah, ditto for me. Not about graphic novels, but everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having us. Awesome. Thank you so much. And also for that kind offer, we will probably uh, retweet a little bit of a reaction to this event so that people get reminded where to to possibly contact you on Twitter if they have some remaining questions. In any case, thank you so much. This was a very fascinating conversation. I think we all learned a lot and it's especially great that you allowed us to record it so that we can go back to it again and again and really uh, profit from your experience and profit from uh, the engaging discussion that you've had.